Back to normal? Not quite. Not yet. As you can see, the sanctuary is still empty, and we may or may not be filming this social media content in our shorts and our flip-flops. You know, I know that many of you have been asking a lot of questions. When will we get back to normal? What will that normal even look like? How and when will it happen? You know, these are all good questions, and good questions that we might not have perfect answers for. But praise the Lord, we're starting to see a light at the end of the tunnel, and hopefully we'll get back sooner than later. In the meantime, we're asking you to join us in prayer as we're asking God for His wisdom and guidance in moving forward in ministry. And today I want to do my best to try to answer some of the questions that you have about ministry moving forward. And then we'll open up the Word of God that answers and speaks to the questions of the heart with the fullness of authority and clarity, through the wisdom and power of God found only in His Scriptures. So let's get right to it. How long will it last? We just don't know. But we'll continue to follow the recommended guidelines until it's safe and wise to resume ministry as normal. We're actively working, we're preparing, we're getting everything in order at church. So when the all clear sign comes, we can open up church immediately. What will ministry look like? For now, the only aspect of ministry that will be open will be our Sunday morning worship service. There'll be no Sunday school classes, no midweek services, no small groups, no Tuesday night Bible study, no prayer house ministry, no Awana children's ministry, no central youth group. Uh, during the worship service, we're not going to have a junior church or a nursery either as well. We want families to stay together. It's the safest environment. And don't worry, your young children, your crying babies won't bother us in any way. The worship will be more of a family style. What does that mean? We're just going to be together and families will be together. Uh, we're also going to keep the worship service shorter. It'll be 45 minutes long to accommodate all the social distancing recommendations of keeping people farther apart. We're going to have to have two worship services at 9.30 a.m. and 11 a.m. Whatever time works best for you, uh, please join us. What safety protocols will be in place? A couple things, uh, very specific and important things. We purchased an ozone air filtration system. Uh, it will be in the sanctuary and it helps neutralize any airborne particles. We've also signed a contract with an environmental company that will come in each week uh, prior to our worship service with an EPA environmentally friendly fog uh, mist system that disinfects the entire sanctuary from top to bottom. Between the two services from 9.30 and 11, we're going to re-clean in-house everything. The doors of the church and the doors of the narthex will be open. You won't have any point of contact. You won't have to touch any doors. The restroom doors will have hand sanitizing uh, stations right next to them so you can take a sanitary wipe to open up your restroom door as you're coming in and out. We'll also have no touch hand sanitizing stations at all ingress and egress. Also no touch thermal thermometers. If you feel comfortable or have a question about your temperature or your feeling, this is voluntary. That will be available as well. We won't have any greeters. We don't want any congestion here at the entrance. We want you to just come in and have a seat. No bulletins so nobody's touching anything, passing it off to you. Also, we'll have signage placed in the narthex and the sanctuary with very clear guidelines reminding people to respect social distancing. Also, very clear instructions on where seating is available and where seating is not available. There won't be any Bibles or hymnals or offering envelopes or pencils in the pews so that you won't have to worry about touching something that somebody else has previously touched. We won't be passing an offering plate. Uh, there'll be a way to contribute your tithes and your offerings as you exit the sanctuary in a safer way. Also, too, uh, we'll have a dismissal process. We don't want everyone then the service just to get up and uh, be points of congregation, so we'll just dismiss you in an orderly way. Again, we're taking all these precautions just to follow the recommended guidelines and to create the safest environment for worship that we can. Well, what if I don't feel comfortable coming back right away? You know, that's a great question. You know, these are uncharted waters, not just for the church, but for the community. And we realize that there's a lot of uncertainty right now. And everyone has to make their own decision. So our best answer to that is, come back when you're ready. Come back when you feel comfortable. And when you do, we'll be excited to see you. Well, how can I still participate in the fellowship of the body of Christ? During this transitional period, we're going to continue to post our sermons and our messages online. You can watch it on our website on the front page there. There's also a link to see previous messages. 
We'll also be having it on our Facebook page, sending out text links. You can direct it to write to our YouTube channel. Also, you can continue to contribute your tithes and your offerings as well. You can drop that in the mail to us, or you can go to our website and pay online, or you can uh, download our giving app, Give Plus. And it's a super easy way to contribute your tithes and your offerings. So you can stay plugged in until you feel comfortable in coming back in person. And we want to thank you for your love and your faithfulness to the Lord during these times. Because we couldn't continue ministry. We couldn't do it without the generosity, the love, and the faithfulness of the body of Christ. The last question, will it ever get back to normal? Yes, it will. It might not be exactly the same, but this too shall pass. One day soon we'll be together again, hugging each other, welcoming each other, shaking each other's hands as we come together and worship. And how sweet that day will be. But until then, we ask that you have full confidence in knowing that your church leadership is taking every step necessary and every precaution we can to provide a safe environment for you and your family to come back to church. So please join us in prayer as we look forward to opening up really soon. Will it ever get back to normal? It will. It will. Because it has to. Because the current form of worship and this connection with the body of Christ that we have today through online services, YouTube sermons, TV messages, drive-in churches, drive-through communions, Zoom Bible studies, go-to meetings. You know, all these things are they're good for now, for the moment for this time in history, for this situation that we find ourselves in. But they're not sustainable for an extended period of time. The body of Christ, the church, the fellowship of believers, the intent of this beautiful family that God orchestrated was never meant for weekly lectures or teachings. It was never meant for virtual services, for isolated instruction and for digital devotion. The church today May 2020 looks more different from the first church, the original church, the church that God ordained. It looks more different than it ever has in the history of the world, except for one thing. And what is that one thing? Commonality. In the book of Acts, chapter 2, verse 44, it says this, Now all who believed were together and had all things in common. In common. What's the commonality that you and I share today, that we all share today? We're all stuck in our homes. We're all in the same boat, following the same rules, the same guidelines, under the same restrictions. We can't go anywhere. We can't do the things that we normally do. The coronavirus, COVID-19, has been the great equalizer. Everyone is doing the same thing, in the same moment, for the same reason, for the same good. But apart from the commonality that we share right now, which is unprecedented, the present state of the church couldn't be any more different than the original church. It couldn't be any more contrasting than the first church, the model that God orchestrated and ordained for our blessing and for His glory. You see, the first church wasn't some sterile environment. It wasn't some socially distant community, six feet apart, No contact, no fellowship, no gathering together, no eating together, no handshakes, no hugs, no hanging out at each other's homes. No, the church wasn't isolated. It wasn't individualistic. It wasn't ill. It wasn't sick. It wasn't some sterile environment. It was healthy. It was alive. It was moving. It was growing. It was vibrant. And it was warm. And the church was together, a living organism a lively group. You know, the church was not a family of four sitting on their couch on a Sunday morning, watching an online message to their smart TV. Then, after the message, going back to their own isolated, sheltered-in, quarantined lives. But even prior to this global pandemic, even prior to this two-month shutdown that we're now in, this time of forced separation and isolation. Even prior to all these things, sadly, there's been a trend in the lack of decreased fellowship in churches today. You see, when you look at the world, you look at our culture today, it makes sense because the world places such an emphasis on being independent. It encourages you, it almost demands you to be your own, to make your own destiny, 
destiny, to do it by yourself. So it's easy to conclude that the doing it on your own mentality is seen as a strength to some, even in our Christian walk. But this isn't so. You see, we really do need each other because God created us that way. And as believers, we do need the body of Christ, the fellowship of the church. God never intended the church to be an isolated body. Our lives are meant to touch each other. This is what the Bible calls fellowship. Fellowship means companionship, family interaction. In the Bible, we see the fellowship of believers together includes many things as they come together. In James 5 verse 16, it talks about accountability in the body of Christ. In Hebrews 10, 24, assembling together, hanging out together, worshiping God with one heart and one purpose. Hebrews 10, 25, encouraging each other, spurring each other on to goodness and good works and to focus. In 1 Corinthians 11, 24 through 25, we take communion together. We break bread together. Romans 12, 13, we can contribute to the needs. We can come together to make sure that other people are okay and that God is meeting their needs through the body of Christ. In Romans 15, verses 1 through 2, we bear each other's burdens. We love each other. We put our arm around each other. We encourage each other. In John 17, 21, we can give other people joy. We can love others in the body of Christ. So I want to encourage you today, as churches begin to have this opportunity very soon to reopen, to restart this communal ministry that we're so used to, the opportunity to come together again, to worship, to congregate, to gather together in God's house, I hope and I pray that that opportunity, when it comes, will be a great encouragement to you. That it'll be a fulfillment to you of a void that maybe you've been feeling here for these last couple months. Something that you've been struggling with as you miss the fellowship, you miss the family, you miss the body of Christ. The love that you feel when you're in God's house. The encouragement that you get, the friendships that you have, the peace that you feel, the biblical instruction, the guidance you get what comes from the teaching of God's Word, the satisfaction that you have when you honor God in worship. You see, these things we're missing to some extent right now. These are things that online content and live stream media can't fulfill. Yes, for the moment, for the time that we're in, these avenues are good. We're doing it right now. They're good for now. They're needed and necessary, but only for the moment because they're not sustainable for an extended period of time. Why? Because this is not the model. This is not the living organism that God intended for the church. And we see the example of that, the purest example in the first church. In Acts chapter 2, I want to begin here in verse 41. Then those who gladly received his words were baptized, and that day about 3,000 souls were added to them. On the day of Pentecost, just some 50 days after Jesus Christ had risen from the dead, ascended back into heaven, the Holy Spirit descended upon the city of Jerusalem. Peter, now filled with the Holy Spirit, the spirit of comfort and promise, preached a sermon. He saw 3,000 people accept Christ as their Savior. This group of people immediately joined this new fellowship of believers, and the church was born. Here in Acts chapter 2, we see this body of believers come together to form the first church. And according to the New Testament definition, the church is the body of Christ of whom which He, God, is the head. The word church is used to describe the entire body of believers who are saved by the relation to Christ. Ephesians 1 verse 22 through 23 says, And He, God, hath put all things under His feet, and gave Him to be head over all things to the church, which is the body, the fullness of Him that filleth all in all. But in addition to the church being the body of Christ is universal body of Christ. We find other meanings attached to the words in the New Testament. The word for church, which is ecclesia, which refers sometimes to the company of believers in a single providence, in a single village, in a single town, those who are meeting in a particular place of worship. Here we find and here we identify with the local church, the local body of Christ. And we see here in Acts chapter 2 that this local body, they were a close-knit group. These new converts to the unsaved world were seen as renegades, traitors. They were persecuted for their faith. So they needed each other. They couldn't be isolated. So they came together for spiritual, emotional, 
and physical support and encouragement. This was their fellowship. The Greek word for fellowship is koinonia. This word reveals the closeness, and not just the closeness, but the dependence upon each other that was displayed so beautifully by the early Christians. You see, to them, fellowship wasn't an option. It was essential. As believers fellowshipping together, praising God, growing in grace, not being consumed from their surroundings. You see, for them, the establishment of fellowship was essential. In addition to essential, it was also beneficial. Continuing here in verse 42. And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship, in the breaking of bread, and in prayers. You see, the activity of the early church was twofold. They were continuing steadfastly. That means they were faithful in coming together. And the believers persisted and continued in learning the Word of God, being fed daily by the teaching of God's Word and doctrine and authority of the truths of God's Word. So the second activity was fellowship. Continuing in verse 43, Then fear came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were done through the apostles. Now all who believed were together, and had all things in common, and sold their possessions and goods, and divided them among all as anyone had need. So continuing daily with one accord in the temple, and breaking bread from house to house, they ate their food with gladness and simplicity of heart. You see what they did together? They didn't just show up on a Sunday morning at 11 a.m. or 9.30 a.m. and sit down and leave. They were interwoven in each other's lives. They broke bread together. They celebrated faithfully communion, the Lord's Supper. They ate together in each other's homes. They hung out. They grew their families together. They grew their friendships. The believers prayed together. They thanked God. You know, what an outpouring of thanksgiving that these early believers must have had when they were demonstrating the realization of God's forgiveness and what Jesus Christ, God on earth, had just done for them when he died, rose again paying for the sins of mankind, and sending back to heaven to sit at the right hand of the throne of God. They were so moved by what they had seen and experienced. Then in verse 43, Then fear came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were done through the apostles. You know, this word for fear isn't that they were afraid, like you're afraid of heights. They had such reverential fear of God, what He had done for them, and what they had seen in the miracles And they were so moved by it. And they had a sense of awe. Then in verse 44, Now all who believed were together, and they had all things in common. They had all things in common. You see, they considered themselves as family. Having everything in common wasn't some form of socialism or communism, because it was something that they were not forced to do. It was a voluntary act. They were not commanded to do it or instructed to do it. They did these things out of the joy of their heart. And it wasn't some form of communal living either. They would distribute their goods if people had need. There was a commonality, a oneness of mentality and unity. And if there was a need, they would meet it. Then verse 47, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved. You see, here is the culmination, the pristineness, the highest value or virtue of fellowship of the body of Christ. When believers come together, held together by Christ, manifesting the lives and the characteristics of the fullness of God and the features of God in them through the Holy Spirit and His gifts. You see, when people see other lives changed through their actions, people can see Christ through you. You see, this is the heart and beauty of fellowship. In addition to the family element, the unity element, the Bible She also shares other benefits of fellowship. Fellowship promotes encouragement. Hebrews 10, 24 through 25 says, Let us consider one another to provoke, to encourage unto love and to good works, not forsaking the assembly of ourselves together, as the manner of some is, but exhorting or encouraging one another, and so much more as you see the day approaching. Fellowship also promotes humility and servanthood. You see, only when we serve our brothers and sisters in Christ can we really experience the true fellowship of God. John 13, verse 14, Jesus told his disciples, If I then, your Lord and Master, have washed your feet, you also to wash one another's feet. Fellowship also promotes answered prayer. Matthew 18, 20, where two or three 
are gathered together in my name. There am I in the midst of them. Fellowship meets needs. We see here in Acts chapter 2. Fellowship, meeting the needs of other believers. They had everything in common. If there was a need, it got met. Because people were plugged in and they were family. And they didn't abandon each other. They bared and shared in one another's burdens, meeting each other's needs. And last, fellowship brings love. John 13 verses 34 through 35 says, A new command I give to you, that you love one another, even as I have loved you that you also love one another. By this, all men will know that you are my disciples if you have love one for another. You see, love is not an option in the church of Jesus Christ. It's a command. The more humble we become, the more encouragement we give, the more we pray, the more we meet other needs for people, the more we share our love with others. Yes, the world may seem temporarily closed, but the church isn't. The church is alive. It's just different right now. It's taken on a different form, but it will get back to normal. And when it does, be a part of it. Don't miss the opportunity to come back together in the house of God, to experience the fellowship, the benefits, the joy, the love that can only come from knowing the unity that we have in the family of God when we're together. Come when you're ready. Come back when you feel comfortable. But don't let this time of isolation, this time of sheltering in, this quarantine period that we've had, don't let it grow complacency in you or grow some form of disinterest or don't let it devalue the opportunities for fellowship and worship that we have. You know, there may be some of you, to be honest, that say, well, hey, for the last eight weeks, for the last two months, uh, I've been completely fine watching online messages and content. Uh, I'll just keep doing this. I I don't see the value of going back to church. I don't need to sit in a pew to go to church. I understand that. But here's the difference. Instruction, online content, teaching is not fellowship. Teaching itself is not body life. It's not family. And religious duty or obligation or ritual is not vibrancy of faith. You see, yes, for the time being, this is all we can do. And it's enough for now. And we're doing our best. But it's not sustainable. If you want to participate in the fellowship of the body of Christ, the family of God, to take all the benefits that we talked about, and all the benefits of that early church and what they experienced, you've got to get back into the fellowship of the body of Christ. Again, come when you're ready, and we'll be there and we'll be ready to minister alongside and worship with you as a family in the body of Christ. You know, one thing I do want to end here with a note is when we're talking about getting plugged back into the fellowship, when we're talking about the value of church, the value of worship and honoring God in all these different ways, this has nothing to do with our eternal security. You see, if you think that those things are dependent upon your eternity in heaven, then you don't understand the difference between grace and works. You see, many faiths, even many people in professing Christianity, struggle with the difference between grace and works. You see, works is that you have to do something to make a holy and righteous God happy. The Bible is very clear that we're all sinners and God is righteous. God can't even be exposed to sin. And that's why Jesus Christ came to this earth to die on the cross to pay for our sins, sacrifice himself for us so we wouldn't have to suffer so we can have everlasting life. And all we have to do is accept the gift that he gave us. In Ephesians 2, 8, 9, one of the most clearest verses, two verses in the Bible that explain the difference between grace and works, read this. For by grace you are saved through faith, faith trusting in God. And not of yourself, it's nothing you can do. It's a gift of God, a free gift, not of works, lest anyone should boast. You know, what a beautiful two verses here. Couldn't be any clearer that we are saved by grace, God's grace. We don't deserve it. His mercy and his love for us through faith. What is faith? Trusting in God. God, if you died on the cross to pay for my sins and I can be saved by faith and faith alone, right now, will you save me for all my sins? I put my faith and trust in you. God, save me. Forgive me of my sins. I trust in you and you alone. And Ephesians 2, 9 says, that's why you're saved, not by your good works. You see, that's the free gift of salvation. 
if you've never really understood the difference and you're not really sure if you've ever even asked God to save you by faith, why not do it right now? In the quietness of your heart, God, save me from my sins. I put my faith and trust in you and you alone. Forgive me. I love you. Save me right now. And God will. And that's the beauty of having a relationship with God. And once you have a relationship with God, He's your Father. You're His son. You're His daughter for all eternity. Nothing can ever remove you from the hands of God and get plugged into the fellowship, the body of Christ that God ordained. And you'll have an amazing journey on your faith walk. God bless. Mm -hmm.